officially welcome to today's event, which is our second anniversary of Oral Pathology 360. And uh, it's great to have everybody. So a big hello to everyone who joined in after we have started. And, uh, you know, in, in a lot of ways, one of the first rules of public speaking is think what your audience wants to hear and not what you want to say. For days now, I have been thinking, what would you all like to hear about Oral Pathology 360? What should I tell you? What should I be sharing? And I could not decide. So then I thought the same way I get help from all of you on a regular basis. So let's have this more as a discussion. And you can help me out by asking me, what do you want to hear? What do you want to know about Oral Pathology 360? So we'll take a few minutes just to chat and you can ask me if you have any queries. You can also give me any suggestions on how we can go ahead because some of you are obviously very familiar with Oral Pathology 360 and very much a part of the whole setup. So whichever way, whether you want to give us a suggestion, whether you have a question, we are all ears and waiting to hear from you. Again, just turn on your camera and your mic and uh, but tell me what you would like to hear. Of course, uh, with a name like uh, Oral Pathology 360 is fairly self-explanatory, I guess, uh, that it is about oral pathology. But uh, uh, it has grown from the point where it was all about oral pathology to being now about a lot of other things. And in a sense, now we have also included oral medicine and uh, there's a realization that it goes well beyond. I mean, for uh, it is finally as a part of healthcare and it has to all work together. So that is definitely there. And which is why this year's conference was an oral diseases and not an oral pathology one, which we had our oral medicine colleagues with us. And it was great fun. So going forward, it is definitely going to be a lot more of oral medicine as we can uh, define them and include them. Uh, we already have some oral medicine colleagues with us also who took part in the conference with us. So that is that. But I do hope we can add more and more. So let's see. Anyone wants to say anything? In the chat, we have Dr. Sudindra. Congratulations. Thank you so much, Dr. Sudindra. Yes, you're also one of the people who always helps. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> Dr. Tilakratne has entered. Oh, he has. I, I can't see him. Sir, where are you? <laughs> no. Oh, there, sir. Ah, hello, sir. Hello, hello. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, sir. Thank you so much. It's so great you could join. No, actually, we, <clears throat> we had our postgraduate exam just finished yesterday. And today, the whole day, I was with the external examiner, and he just he just left about four to five minutes ago. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Anyway, I definitely know you are always there. You are always one of those pillars from behind that is helping and holding up the whole thing. So you are there, whether physically there or not, you are there. I know it. But I'm really happy to see you today. Thank you. Yes, so does anybody have anything they want to ask about Oral Pathology 360 or make a comment? So since you came in late, I suggested that instead of me telling, talking about Oral Pathology 360, I could share any, you know, like I'm open to any question anyone has. Anyone has any questions? Ma'am, uh, can, I, can I contribute? Yes, please. Ma'am, the one problem uh, most of us encounter in uh, oral pathology is the dispute and the conflict between the oral surgeons, oral medicine, and uh, oral pathologists regarding the uh, cases and their handling and further uh, fighting uh, for the authorship. So can you bring these three platforms together, experts together, to do something uh, really uh, working because this problem exists in every academic institution where one feels superior to the other. Surgeon says, uh, I'm the one who is doing the treatment. 
and the uh, uh, clinician says uh, credit goes to and oral pathologists will be left out so can something be done in this area ma'am many of us would have tried this and failed again and again and here there are amazing experts can any solution be drawn out of this uh, 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 this platform ma'am because you are doing an amazing work and i'm sure you'll be able to contribute in uh, some way thank you thank you i i can definitely hope and i think you know the thing is that it is not the collective all of us know oral medicine and oral surgery specialists with who we can work very well and we also know the ones that we cannot work with very well but let me defer to our seniors who are here and who must have worked with a lot of people let me go with professor jos first uh he has years of experience and interaction right. with everybody else and then we will ask tilak ratna sir to put in his experience both are very rich in experience so let's defer to them sir dr jos um are you talking about preference of authorship in in case reports Yes, Is I think not question? preference in the part. I think it's more yeah, about yeah. how do we just Finally, work together. <laughs> yes, sir. Finally, the uh, I'll, I'll, I'll problem, uh, yeah, problem lies in the authorship, sir. Especially the case report. This dispute and conflicts will come, and this is a common phenomenon in every academic institution uh, where uh, authorship problems uh, will come. How to address them, sir? Well, we have a rule: is that. Um, in South Africa, it is the intellectual input. the initiation intellectual input that comes the highest <clears throat> um then if surgeons or other people contribute images but they do not provide any kind of intellectual input they get acknowledged but not seen as authors but it very much depend also on departments for example um in our department the the last author is usually the guiding author whereas the first author is the one that initiated the research or the case report and then but it goes on amount of intellectual input and that can be stated sometimes the amount of percent for example for the first author 50% for the second author 25% third order 15% and so on like that this what do you have i mean you just finished editing the who book so how did you get through that i don't see that as a big problem uh, as long as you have proper understanding among the 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 different parties to take part in the in the treatment process i i think there there is no problem at all when it comes to a proper research because we know what the country as just correctly said uh, there are proper guidelines by various bodies uh, who is an author uh, so as long as those criteria are fulfilled i think uh, the, everybody who fulfill those criteria should be an author but more uh if the importantly when it comes to case reports we know the the surgeon the, the treatment the radiologist do the imaging part the pathologist uh, does the the diagnosis i think they all should be uh, part of the, the case report it's not a big research project but they all have contributed for the case uh, again as just correctly said the f- uh, the first author should be the person who initiated it it could be a surgeon it could be a pathologist it could be a radiologist but the person who initiated it and gives the the highest contribution should be the first author uh, i in my career actually i have come across uh, th- that problem when i was young but later on i i don't think we had that problem so it is a matter of understanding uh, between your team uh, as long as the team understands i don't think it's a big problem but for a proper research project of course you know from the initiation of the research proposal uh, up to the uh, the preparation of the manuscript every single author should take part in various aspects that is why good journals always ask what the contribution of particular authors if you have uh, 10 authors you have to give at the end of the manuscript the contribution by every single person Uh, just because uh, he is a friend or he is in the same department we cannot put their names 
Uh, so, but that happens, uh, mind you, that happens uh, uh, all over the world, but that is not correct. So, Hope I think it's clear. Yes. So, I think when we were, and when I was in courts, we tried this, uh, Nandini also is here, we, we tried this, it was not entirely successful, maybe I left early, but whatever. So, we had this plan, uh, which was for cases, that was for case presentations, that by turn, one of the departments would be the lead author, then the second and third, and that would be by turn. It would be decided. That was what we tried with some success, not entirely, but okay. <laughs> right. So that was about that. Anything else that, but well, it was a good point of the Sudhindra. These are things that I think a part of the reason I thought we need to move out of just oral pathology and extend beyond was partly this. In fact, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you have been observing the, uh, the sign that uh, the picture, the logo that comes below each uh, lecture, each talk now has the picture of a CT scan, a microscope, a DNA and uh, so that is the standard, all three. If we are doing only oral pathology, I leave only the microscope on. And in fact, when we have treatment, it also has the surgical blade. So I'm beginning to you know, code the content so that people know what to watch and who would like to watch what. But I also would like to have a lot of interaction, yeah. I think this time for the conference, we were very uh, lucky. We could get in uh, Dr. Hieronimo from, uh, oh, I forgot where he's from. Uh, okay, from South America. And uh, I'm not sure whether he's from Argentina or Brazil. <laughs> I think it's from Argentina. And uh, we also had Dr. Larry. Uh, so we had two oral medicine specialists and that was a very interesting and a very good interaction actually. That made a lot of difference. So anything anyone else wants to say? Um, can I say something? Uh, yes, Dr. Vivek. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Good evening, ma'am. Ma'am, uh, I am just an assistant professor, ma'am, but I actually wait for all the programs that go on on oral pathology 360. And uh, it is very nice, ma'am. Actually, when we are in college teaching or just studying, ma'am, we are just in between seven to eight teachers or, or our colleagues, ma'am. But on this platform, I have seen that all the international speakers and all the, I suppose, the, all the great teachers are there, <laughs> almost are here on this platform, ma'am. And that is a very nice thing for a student like me to get something of, of this subject, ma'am. I'm very grateful, ma'am, that such a platform has been made for oral pathologists, ma'am. And actually, ma'am, uh, while, uh, while attending these programs, it's just like getting into a class, like we used to get you know, during the, uh, when we were PG students or undergraduate students, ma'am. So it just comes in mind that I have to go into class, so I just get ready and, and try to attend all the classes that I can. Thank you. Yes, I think that is that is really uh, my involvement is more of a chance. I mean, anyone else could have done essentially the same thing. It was being there at the right time and having the situation to do this. I think the great achievement or the great contribution is of all the experts and all the people who keep coming in every week. Uh, very often they are busy. They make time. They you know they juggle their. Uh, own work and, and they make it a point to turn up and they really put out some exceptional lectures, I must say. And uh, in fact, there have been friends who were inevitably sometimes last minute, uh, you know, lectures cannot happen. The, although I fixed the lectures almost three to four months ahead, but sometimes it happens, you know, last minute, someone has something coming up and they can't make it. So it, it has so often happened that uh, I've had to call friends and say, uh, please, I have this week's lecture, what can you do? <laughs> and inevitably, I mean, all these weeks, as you know from the proof that uh, we have not so far even missed one single week, that uh, it has always worked. Someone has always stepped in and, and that is an amazing contribution from everybody. I, it's truly amazing. And that's, that really is the power of today's world and the, you know, the digital uh, era that we are in that there is uh, no barrier no barrier at all so any barriers are truly just in our own minds 
Mandana, there is one yeah. message from Yota mm. Prabhuna. He right. has one humble suggestion that in yeah. future you can fix episodes or even series with biotechnologists or bioinformatic researchers for, for next level research like in silico analysis, gene interaction. It will help us to update, especially those who are in peripheral institution. Yes. Dr. Yoitap, you can put on your uh, mic. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm here. Yeah. 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 Right. So uh, are you meaning that uh, we should have it as, uh, as updating everyone on the latest research or an interaction? Uh, in both the way, it will be good, ma'am, since because uh, earlier in last decades we we talked enough to, enough on IHC, PCR, uh, ELISA, all those things. But uh, we are slowly moving towards the next level of research where in silico analysis or gene interaction, intractome became uh, the hardcore of the research. Uh, so I think it will be an eye opener if you start with an episode with that, and then later we we can slowly move on like. Uh, uh, hands on even like it is all virtually made uh, so I think that will be better uh, for uh, those who are uh, upcoming uh, young pathologists yes that is a very good uh, plan I've been looking actually to include people who can uh, you know talk to us technology so yes. what is the latest technology that's being used maybe in a lab and they can explain to us and so that the next people the next generation knows what is the uh, what is the technology available and how to use it. Yes, ma'am. Because like uh, uh, we have to come into a common platform uh, to go to a next level of research. Uh, for example, uh, uh, if I'm uh, communicating with a biotechnologist or bioinformatics, I couldn't able to observe their terminology, what they are using, and what they cannot able to understand what we actually need, either tumor in specific, whether it is odontogenic tumor or oral squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, so it needs a lot of time for the interaction for a better understanding. Uh, so definitely, I'm sure it will be an eye opener uh, for a, uh, if, if we have a session on this, it will definitely, uh, it will be an eye opener. ma'am. And I have to congratulate you uh, because uh, you are uh, such a pioneer <laughs> in this work. I'm following uh, your all your works. Thank you so much. Thank you. In fact, now there are lots of channels and there's a lot happening with oral pathology, which is very, very, uh, very nice and feels good. Okay, so we are coming close to... So, Dr. Yoita, uh, uh, we will get in touch. I will get in touch with you and maybe we can work on this further, yes. Sure. Anything else uh, anyone wants to say because... Can I have a query right here? We have about 90 people here and quite a few on YouTube. Uh, how many of you would prefer to change the timing of the, of the Tuesday's program? So instead of it being fixed at 11 a.m. IST, which of course means that on certain days we have to have a recorded program because people from other parts of the world cannot be present live at 11 o'clock IST. So, should we keep it? The Tuesday will be fixed, but should we move the timing so that it is always live? Can everybody who agrees raise their hand? There is the option to raise your hand. If you agree that we change the timing. Moving, what will be the change of the timing? What, how much uh, variation in this time? Uh, so then it will depend really on the timing of the person speaking. It will, of course, never be in the middle of the night for us because even I need to be awake. <laughs> but, but it will be somewhere maybe early evening, evening or maybe late afternoon, basically depending on what is a uh, practical time for the person speaking. To be frank with you, ma'am, we are used to it and it's like it is scheduled. You know, Tuesdays are meant for this. We, are, uh, we, yeah. are, uh, we have planned according to that. 11 uh, Tuesday is a very good uh, if you, if it's possible, you can continue, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, how how many think uh, that we should change? I'm seeing five five um, raised hands. Out of ninety four, five arms are raised. Seven have raised. Seven. Yeah. yeah. 
okay so the majority are used to 11 o'clock and like it at 11 o'clock i think <laughs> okay cool so we will for now stay at 11 o'clock fixed dr selvi you can now uh, yes you can introduce uh, yeah. the moderators and then we will begin so hello all welcome to today's anniversary special program and we are having an oral cancer update we have two programs going on simultaneously one is on the zoom and that has a capacity of 100 participants and beyond that we have it on the um, uh, youtube link so people who are not able to join here can please again try and join in the youtube and we have around more than 430 participants today who have registered from around 42 countries and we have some moderators specially to manage that this event goes on well so first i would like to introduce dr nandini she is working as professor and head in the department of oral pathology uh, regional institute of medical sciences imphal manipal the east eastern part of india and she has more than 20 years of experience as teacher both undergraduate and postgraduate she has around 70 publications in various journals and her area of interest includes pediatric pathology developmental disorders odontogenic lesions and salivary gland diseases dr nandini you can raise your hand dr nandini for everyone to see you thank yeah. you so much ma'am thank you <laughs> humble with the introduction and, thank you ma'am and today she will be moderating the youtube channel and whatever queries are raised over there she will be bringing it forth here so our next moderator is dr josil or professor josil who is very senior professor and he is from south africa he has recently retired from the head of as a head of department at university of western cape in cape town south africa he was uh, working for more than 36 year as a qualified oral and maxillofacial pathologist and he has been quite active in training oral pathologists for african countries welcome dr jos hille please raise your hand yeah thank you and with this we will go to the first speaker of the day uh, dr henry adiola and uh, i request dr mandana to give the introduction professor henry adiola holds a phd degree in cancer proteomics and genomics at the university of cape town south africa he holds the position of principal investigator and group leader of the proteomics pathology and molecular imaging group at the hsr laboratory at uct professor henry was appointed project manager of the cancer research initiative of the faculty of health sciences at uct where he provided leadership for the phd mentorship program facilitating conferences seminars and meetings with various cancer research interest groups and funders he was instrumental in setting up and developing a state of the art molecular omics analytical histopathology and tissue culture laboratory at the skin and hair research laboratory of the division of dermatology at uct he is an nrf rated scientist and recipient of the uct faculty of health sciences merit award between 2020 and 2022 based on his exceptional contribution to teaching service leadership and social responsiveness professor henry's research expertise spans a vast array of fields that include oral and maxillofacial pathology epidemiology molecular oncology and program evaluation As we look forward to listening to Professor Henry's lecture, something that Pulitzer Prize-winning author Siddhartha Mukherjee wrote in his book *The Emperor of All Melodies: A Biography of Cancer* comes to mind. 
He wrote, cancer perhaps is the ultimate perversion of genetics, a genome that becomes pathologically obsessed with replicating itself. Professor Henry, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you to deliver your lecture. Good day, dear colleagues. It's a great privilege and honor to be invited to give a talk at the second anniversary event of the Oral Pathology 360 under the leadership of Professor Mandana Donahu and the collaborators from Vaidehi and Goa Dental College. Uh, I am Henry Adeola, an Associate Professor from the Department of Medicine at the University of Cape Town. Today, I will present to you a topic entitled Omics and Systems Biology Tools for Precision Oral Cancer Diagnostics with a focus on resource limited settings of the world. I acknowledge that I am not the most qualified person uh, to discuss this topic with distinguished colleagues like yourself. Neither am I here because I have succeeded exceedingly in applying omics and systems biology to oral cancer in all resource limited settings of the world. I have come to solicit your support and camaraderie in not only gaining knowledge in this novel field, but actually making deliberate efforts to leverage and implement them in your own practice and policy recommendations. I'd like to begin this discussion with my favorite quote from Helen Keller, who said, what I am looking for is not out there, it is in me. Quite frequently, we seek something or someone to make us happy when we ought to be looking at ourselves for positivity. Helen Keller was a woman who at the age of two became deaf and blind, living in a world of darkness and silence, spending most of her life trying to break through this problem. But with the help of Anne Sullivan, who was a teacher, she learned to write, read, and do a lot of impressive things, including writing a lot of profound quotes like this one. Before I begin, I would like to make a few disclaimers. Firstly, I will not be focusing on too much intricate details of each method, which is obviously beyond the scope of a 40 minute talk. I only hope to provide some foundational concepts that would foster scholarship of engagement and hopefully alleviate the burden of oral cancer. Also, it is not all stories of gloom and doom. Some great positive strides have already been made so there is no room for discouragement or self-pity. So let's first look at some nomenclature around oral cancer. What really is oral cancer? Several names have been used to describe cancers that occur in the oral head and neck region, such as those listed here. These fragmented descriptions of anatomically contiguous regions often lead to inaccuracies in the overall burden and can lead to significant underreporting or even overreporting. Now, WHO says good oral health is important to the overall health, and many oral lesions are indicators of underlying systemic condition. Hence, oral health and cancer are matters of great importance. For example, a study published in SADJ in 2018 showed that the combined Age standardized incidence rate for anatomically contiguous head and neck cancer sites yielded a higher disease burden and observed that the general sixth position and ranking increased to third position in Africa. Upper right panel shows a proposed categorization nomogram for upper aerodigestive tract cancer depending on whether you add uh, cancers affecting the esophagus or not. You can see in the lower panels that the global age standardized incidence risk color changed between UADTC and HNC. I would like to quickly take us through a few glossary terminologies. First of this is the term limited resources. There are two key factors in scarcity. One part is limited resources which indicates a reduction in the canonical factors of production, which are finite. And the other is the fact that man's wants are unlimited. 
And these two factors always lead to a situation where there is a need for growth and investment. When you say molecular diagnostics, what do you really mean? We are familiar with the orthodox diagnostic pipeline where patients' tissues are processed, stained with hematoxylin and eosin, and viewed under the microscope to obtain cellular and histopathologic patterns, which is what obtains in most of the low and middle income countries. Molecular diagnostics is basically applying knowledge of molecular biology tools like genomics, proteomics, etc. Et to medical testing for disease diagnosis. An emerging buzzword is precision oral health, which basically indicates a multifaceted data-driven approach to tease the molecular risk profile of patients apart to provide customized treatment for them based on risk profile instead of using a one-size-fits-all method. And this is very important for personalized medicine, which uses molecular information to manage disease in an individualized manner. We don't have to use a one-size-fits-all approach for therapy of patients, but we must stratify them molecularly before commencing treatment. To further buttress that point, I have illustrated here a practical example of showing molecularly heterogeneous populations of patients with adenocarcinoma of the lungs based on driver oncogenes such as ALK, KRAS, and HER2, and so forth. But most express EGFR. Those carrying the EGFR driver oncogenes can then be further subclassified with most carrying exon 19 deletion, which can affect heterogeneity of driver oncogenes. So this kind of lends itself to use an alternative and effective therapy for another patient or individualize the treatment. Now let's talk about systems biology, which is a computational and mathematical modeling method for interrogation of complex biologic systems that involve large-scale quantification of many molecules, which may be proteins, lipid, and mRNA, and tend to view biologic system at multi-scale and dimension. Integrating data in this manner has yielded fruits in personalized medicine and personalized drug development. It involves integrating multiple datasets in computational and software heavy manner. And sometimes you may be dealing with a biologic network as complex as this one on your right. How can we define a biomarker? It is a measurable biologic, chemical or physical characteristics or objective indicators of normal biologic state, progress of disease, or response to drug therapy. Some attributes of a good biomarker include the fact that they are safe and highly specific, sensitive, uh, accurate in detection, easily measurable, consistent across ethnicity and gender. There are many types, but our focus today would be on cancer biomarkers. Cancer biomarkers can be classified as diagnostic, prognostic, predictive, chemo prevention, screening, and risk stratification, etc. And pharmacological classes will include biomarkers of target verification, pharmacodynamics, assay, treatment selection, and surrogate endpoint. The final glossary terminology that we'll be dealing with today is omics-based approach, which are essentially new techniques that allow for the analysis of the full complements of molecule and information in a system. And the names are growing on a daily basis. There are so many omics that approach. I have put here a few and, and, and a few more now, this cartoon that I'm going to show you uh, is a parallel or a comparison between 
the traditional biochemistry approach as compared to omics based approach uh, and you can see the skinny man on the on the rock uh, trying to fish for one gene as compared to the to the heavy man on the on, on, on a tractor fishing so many genes gaining information which means that uh, omics tend to be essentially more high throughput as compared to traditional biochemistry this is a very interesting paper published about 10 years ago by Garcia et al, who proposed a way to bridge the basic and clinical dental research disconnect using a multi-omic approach for personalized oral health. Data that is acquired from basic research can feed into improving clinical care, diagnostic risk management, prevention, and of course, treatment. Unfortunately, Many of these are not yet in clinical practice. So, what is our roadmap for navigating this very broad topic? Our roadmap includes discussing some general challenges and then we would look at molecular diagnostics challenges. We will touch on a few common omics tools with exemplars and future prospects. Finally, some suggestions on the way forward will be recommended. What are the general challenges? Firstly, financial disparity as compared to the developed world. There is also the issue of health risk disparity. And there is poor access to research materials, conferences, and so on. There is lack of oral pathology manpower and high workload leading to disinterest in research as this is seen as additional work. Many hospitals are poorly equipped with basic amenities and infrastructures such as internet and electricity. There is unfavorable health policies, poor collaboration, that is silo mentality. So many researchers would rather keep all of their research themselves and close to their chest rather than opening up networks and collaborations and linkages that would improve research in Africa and in other LMICs. The level of education is also an issue which creates a knowledge gap. There is incessant wars and political unrest, which is quite frequent around election period. There is lack of good population-based registries with a skimpy distribution of hospital-based registries. Also, there is poor data collection, annotation and storage and curation at hospitals, dental centers, oral pathology units, which creates a record gap. There are numerous religious and cultural beliefs, including taboos and superstitions, which reduces the compliance of patients. Hence, the LMIC governments should plan, plan properly uh, and be more futuristic in their approach. They should be proactive rather than reactive and the list goes on. Let's look at some examples of global financial disparities. If we look at the country income group, most of Africa, Asia and South America are in the red, orange and yellow, which means they are LMICs. And the orange and red are lower middle and low income countries respectively. Looking at the depth profile of countries with World Bank, blue is IBRD, which stands for International Bank for Reconstruction and Development. They borrow at market rate. While orange is IDA, which stands for International Development Association, and they borrow at concessional rates. Again, you would observe that most of Africa, South America, Middle East, and Asia are heavy borrowers from the World Bank. The last panel shows the same profile in low and middle income countries looking at how much people spend on internet access, with red being less than 1% and 
and yellow being greater than 100%. Most of Africa and many places in Asia still spend greater than 100% of their mean income on getting access to internet. Same dismal data profile can be observed for medical risk where most LMIC countries have variable to extreme medical risk. And for women's risk of mortality from communicable maternal, perinatal, and nutritional diseases. The bubble plots on the map show where the risk of infectious disease are greatest, and it can be observed that the LMIC regions have the hugest risks. Finally, when comparing life expectancy, many LMICs are in the lilac and purple range which stands for less than 50 plus and less than 50, while most Western worlds have greater than 75 years of life expectancy. So these examples show the extent of a few of the challenges faced by resource-limited regions of the world. Now to molecular diagnostic challenges. For oral pathologists, it is highly important to know if a lesion is benign or malignant. And then there is the issue relating to intratumor heterogeneity and interbiopsy heterogeneity. Different biopsies of a tumor can present different molecular profile, and this alludes to the benefits of molecular classification or profiling over simple histological classification. Also, the use of immunosochemistry has resulted in variable results that often require further molecular testing and diagnosis. For example, the lesions depicted here all look fairly similar but have divergent diagnosis. Many useful tools such as the Visilite and the Velscope have been used for clinical screening of malignant and pre-malignant lesions, but the drawback remains the lack of specificity, particularly in scenarios of chronic inflammation in the oral cavity. So this calls for careful consideration. I'm showing here intratumor heterogeneity that can arise as a result of clonal evolutionary gene mutation. The cell clones gain additional mutational profile along the progeny. This article by Gerlinga et al. was a brilliant paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing differences in the mutational profile of renal tissues by multi-regional sequencing. Another paper by Berger et al. in 2011 showed the benefit of molecular profiling over the traditional glycine score system used for prostate cancer classification. It was found that there were seven prostate cancer genomes based on using the Tempress 2 erg fusion genes as depicted in the circus plots presented. Looking at immunohistochemistry, either using a single or panel of markers, this has been beneficial and has been a mainstay of histopathological diagnosis in many well of diagnostic services in the LMICs. This can be direct or indirect depending on whether you are looking directly in tissue or in blood. However, putative drawbacks such as error-prone lengthy process, stroke background staining, and antibody cross-reactivity, poor enzyme or antibody potency, weak staining, and autofluorescence, depending on the nature of the tissue or fixation method, have been well-known drawbacks to this technique. Let's now take a look at a few common omics and emerging systems biology tools that can impact the way that we diagnose and treat oral cancer in the future. I will begin with some of the low to medium throughput molecular diagnostic tools that have significantly improved the field of precision oral cancer diagnostics. This includes electrophoresis, western northern southern blotting, which are protein, RNA, and DNA respectively. The enzyme-linked immunosorbent assays, RNA interference using 
small interfering RNA and short helping RNA, cloning, PCR, both conventional and real-time qualitative PCR, fluorescent in situ hybridization, comparative gene genomic hybridization, karyotyping, and chromosomal cytogenetic analysis. Many of the low to medium throughput techniques have benefited from the evolution of molecular biology, such as the establishment of the Watson and Crick's model of the DNA in 1953. Also, the improvement on the understanding of the central dogma of molecular biology, which was greatly improved in the 70s. The completion of the Human Genome Project in 2003 and the currently ongoing chromosome-centric human proteome project. This advancement in technology has led to a myriad of established individual and manifold signatures that characterize oral cancer. Cytogenetic and molecular alterations in potentially malignant oral lesions have been identified as shown here. Important molecular alterations include microsatellite instability, abnormal mismatch repair, and loss of heterozygosity. Gene loci identified to be important in dysplasia and carcinoma in situ are also shown. It is noteworthy that the risk of cancer increases 33-fold when there is involvement of 3P and or 9P. Also, various cytogenetic molecular alterations have been identified for squamous cell carcinoma as shown here, and e adherin integrins, matrix metalloproteinases, interleukin-8, CCR7, and EGFR have been shown to be markers of metastatic squamous cell carcinoma. Looking at genetic salivary gland biomarkers, various fusion oncogenes have been identified for different salivary gland tumors as shown here. It is important to note that the CPG methylation or epigenetic change of EW1, FOXE1, TBX4, PITX1 have been identified for salivary duct carcinoma, but less so for mucoepidermoid carcinoma and adenoid cystic carcinoma. And some molecular targeted therapies such as CKIT, EGFR, NF-kappa-B, and VEGF have been explored for salivary gland tumors. Here, I present the canonical model of sequential carcinogenesis where the lesion initially starts as a benign squamous hyperplasia and gradually proceeds into frank carcinoma. Just as we see the progression of the lesion in the clinical picture, there is a concomitant histological progression from normal mucosa to invasive carcinoma. As well as evolution of genetic mutations, as the oral cancer progresses. For example, a hyperplastic oral lesion that was expressing loss of heterozygosity of 9P21 may now express a loss of heterozygosity of 10Q23 as it advances to cancer. Again, let me share with you another profound quote from Helen Keller, whose most important life meaning stems from having a goal and making plans to see them through. Besides the omics technology, there is a host of other ancillary techniques that can play a complementary role in the development of personalized and precision medicine. This includes sequencing techniques nanotechnology, uh, including quantum dots, composite organic-inorganic nanoparticles, surface-enhanced Raman scattering, molecular imaging, lab-on-chip, flow cytometry, 
point of care diagnostics, stem cell and regenerative medicine, and quantum medicine. We will discuss a few uh, of these omics techniques and try to touch on as much of these other techniques as possible in the following slides. Let's start with genomics. An interesting study by Sweeney et al, which was reported in Nature Genetics in 2015, used genomics approaches to identify BRAF mutation as commoner in mandibular ameloblastomas as compared to smoothing gene, which was found to be commoner in maxillary ameloblastomas among the cohorts investigated. This type of molecularly specific uh, approach holds the key to the future of precision oral health, whereby even these profiles may be subclassified molecularly. Another interesting genomics paper by Gomez et al. in 2014 showed intratumor heterogeneity in amyloblastoma follicles based on EGFR and BRAF expression. This has a potential for molecular personalized classification of follicular amyloblastomas based on these markers. And they also showed expression of TSP1 and HGF as markers of aggressive tumor behavior and BRAF resistance in some follicles. Similarly, transcriptomics analysis have been employed for profiling human papillomavirus positive and HPV negative oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma and key molecular biological processes and functions that delineate these two categories were identified. This potentially paves a way for developing precision molecular targets for diagnosis and treatment of HPV-related oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. Molecular intratumor heterogeneity has also been demonstrated in head and neck squamous cell carcinoma using next generation sequencing. And Zhang et al. in this paper have been able to recapitulate the cellular processes and the mutational profiles that are involved in the development of HPV positive or negative head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. The next omics that I will touch on is proteomics. Before we dive into it, I would like to highlight some of the key issues in proteomics that are worthy of careful consideration. Let me juggle your memory a bit with the flow of molecular information from the DNA, which is static, and then which is transcripted to the RNA, which is variable, and then translated to proteins, which are even more variable. There are a few rationale that a researcher needs to consider when doing proteomics work. The first is that there are still many gene products that we know nothing about. And then we want to know which transcripts are translated into proteins. And then what do these proteins do? Where is this protein? Where is their home address? Where do they live? Are they in the cytosol, in the nucleus? Are they in the Golgi? You know, you need to know that. And which proteins are their binding partners? And also, finally, the kind of post-translational modification that these proteins experience. A very interesting proteomic work was carried out by Chi et al. using maldi toftov ms to identify interferon signaling as one of the most significantly altered pathways in oral squamous cell carcinoma. They also determined that ubiquitin cross-reactive protein UCRP is overexpressed in majority of cheek and tongue cancers and in several cases of larynx cancer. Interestingly, they identified uh, that interferon beta stimulates UCRP expression in oral cancer uh, samples. Uh, and then this shows that the 
extent to which proteomics is highly useful for early protein biomarker discovery and understanding the functional biologic pathways in carcinogenesis. Next, I will talk about the application of a lipidomics approach to tissue conserving surgery and to address high rates of positive or close margin lesions that necessitates the need to reoperate cancer. This usually results from the surgeon's intraoperative inability to rapidly evaluate resection margin status. The intelligent knife, also known as eye knife, provides a near real time uh, in vivo intraoperative tissue classification that may be used by surgeons to better guide oncological margin control. It uses mass spectrometric and chemometrics analysis of tissue specific ionic content of the surgical diatomic smoke plume for the rapid identification of disease dissected uh, breast tissue. So I'm going to show a, a, a clip now of how important and how interesting this work was. The eye knife in action here on a piece of meat in a demonstration at St. Mary's Hospital in London. Every operating theatre has electrosurgical knives which use heat to cut tissue. The clever part is the machine to which it's connected. The smoke that's produced is vaporised tissue. This is sucked along a tube into a mass spectrometer, which in effect sniffs the smoke, analysing its molecules. Early trials published in the journal Science show it was 100% accurate in telling whether the tissue was cancerous. And the answer comes in a second. It's going to be tens of thousands of pounds. Surgeons at Imperial College London who helped develop the eye knife think it could save lives. You should have a safer operation because we don't remove unnecessary or incorrect tissue. And you should have a better cosmetic effect because we will have to remove less tissue. And that's not important in all surgery, but it is important in, in things like breast surgery. That's crucial because one in five women with a cancerous breast lump need repeat surgery because some of the tumour was missed first time. The eye knife will be expensive, but might ultimately save hospitals money. I think it's one of the biggest step forwards in cancer surgery, <laughs> at least in a decade, because what we're doing is adapting something that already happens in, from a procedural point of view uh, to generating completely new knowledge for diagnostics that simply wasn't there before. Um, and we think that that in its own right makes it really transformational. It may also be useful beyond surgery during diagnostic investigations, for example, to do real-time analysis of gut samples. The eye knife is undergoing patient trials at three London hospitals. If these go well, then it could be approved for use throughout the NHS within five years. Isn't that cool? Okay, now let's talk metabolomics. So using NMR-based metabolomics analysis, metabolite biomarkers of early diagnosis of oral cancers have been identified. The authors found discriminant uh, metabolite uh, between serum samples collected from cancer and control patients. And these biomarkers could discriminate between different stages of disease. The metabolic profile obtained from oral cancer was significantly uh, important, even for early stage disease and relatively small tumors. Such a systemic metabolic response to cancer bears great potential for early diagnosis of oral cancer. Our next bus stop is epigenomics. So epigenomics is emerging a very crucial tool in building our understanding of cancer. Two common epigenetic changes are DNA methylation and histone modification. We can see here in this paper epigenetic perturbations that characterize normal cells and the processes that need to be signaled before normal cells can transform into cancer cells. Interestingly, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, the ASCO, recognized 
Epigenetic molecular profiling uh, technique as the most significant advancement in cancer in 2021, whereby molecular epigenetic features are matched to targeted therapies for patients. Also, nanotechnology approaches have also been used to improve our understanding of oral cancer. So, approaches used include surface enhanced Riemann spectroscopy, uh, composite organic and inorganic nanoparticles, and quantum dots, which are quite useful for diagnostic histopathology. Molecular imaging is very important due to its non-invasiveness. In this paper, Nitin et al. used a topical delivery system of EGFR tact conjugates to image changes in epidermal growth factor expression associated with oral neoplasia. They explored the potential of EGFR targeted fluorescent agents for in vivo molecular imaging, which may aid the diagnosis and characterization of oral neoplasia as well as real time detection of tumor margins. Finally, in this series, I would like to mention the role of quantum medicine, which, as presented in this paper, perturbations of biological quantum field may play an important role in the evolution of cancer development from normal cells. Many other quantum theories have been proposed for DNA mutation, which includes DNA quantum tunneling. So we see that much progress has been made in the field of omics for oral cancer, but many LMICs are still trying to catch up. So let us not say it is just daydreaming. It is already happening and LMICs must also benefit from these novel techniques. So let us discuss some of the ways forward. One of the ways forward is funding infrastructure, which would essentially bridge the record gap. We also need to fund researchers and train them, which would essentially bridge the knowledge gap. Pathologists must take the lead. They can't afford to be passive or to follow because we are the custodians of the specimen. We also have to have an integration of omics based approaches into clinical practice. There has to be quality assurance, both internally and externally. So when we run tests, they must be trusted. So this speaks to things like ISO certification. Uh, we also need to have health policy changes. This has to do with influencing policy. We also need to invite the private sectors and NGOs to participate in bringing these novel technologies to LMICs. The reimbursement policies are important. The doctors who practice omics need to be reimbursed, reimbursed uh, accordingly. Also, there has to be the legal uh, uh, interest. So there has to be legal backing for this uh, process. And also, uh, it's very important to think of how to leverage uh, innovatively and maximize scarce resources. Uh, I mean, most of LMICs have people who use smartphones. Uh, they, some have uh, good access to internet, albeit institutionally. All of this is very important. Other ways forward include collaborations, collaborate on ideas, on research, equipment and meetings, can be local or regional or African or global or, or across the world. So this is very, very important. Then there has to be research and educational networks. The, 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 the approach uh, and the practice has to be transdisciplinary. There has to be team science. And then we need to integrate omics into some of our training schemes or our undergraduate and postgraduate medical education pathways. For example, I'm aware that in the US and in Europe, they have a program called TRIG, which is training residents in genomics. Residents who are tra trained in genomics are more likely to prescribe or to request for genomic investigations. And then they, 
they, they of course uh, follow that up with the residence in service examination. So basically you get trained and at the same time you get examined whether you are competent or not. Uh, and it's very important that people consider super specialization. So also telepathology, remote consulting is very, very important. And also we, we need to consider developing very smart, cheap, affordable point of care tools that can be used for the screening and detection of oral cancer. And also uh, uh, very, very routine and uh, periodically, we need to think about uh, training the trainers uh, when last did some uh, some of the people who are training students, when last did they themselves receive any form of training? So it's very, very important uh, that there has to be continuous uh, medical education. And also, uh, this is uh, almost a reality at this point uh, that we are going to have more of morphomolecular histopathologic reports. So the histopathology does not and that macroscopic features, microscopic features diagnosis. So there has to be some more molecular uh, requests in terms of uh, PCRs or, or genomics or proteomics, whatever that, that would be. So we published a paper uh, in 2018 describing the need for dentist scientists in Africa, uh, which we were hoping could be a model uh, for most uh, LMICs uh, because they have similar challenges. So these clinically trained dental scientists uh, are a critical workforce for developing precision oral health in resource scarce regions. So here is an example of leverage, which was an innovative idea from Mass General Hospital where iPhones are connected to parallel cloud computing and digital images of tumor from remote regions can be analyzed and then diagnosis is sent back to these remote regions. Uh, so this is a model that can be explored for remote oral pathology consultation between partnering wealthier institutions and resource scarce LMICs. And of course, Interdisciplinary team science is the way to go, no silos. Uh, multiple disciplines have to come together to solve the problems of uh, oral cancer in LMIC. I would like to finally leave you with a reflection. The human genome sequencing, which costed over a hundred million dollars in 2001, is now in the sub thousand cost range and still going down. This means that patients are now likelier to request more genomic tests since it is becoming more affordable. For example, if a patient arrives at your desk with a flash drive containing genomics report from a tumor asking you, what are my chances? How at risk am I? Would you be ready? to interpret the results for them and take over the management. What I'm proposing in essence is that we have a window of opportunity in LMICs to leverage existing and add emerging diagnostic opportunities to lower the burden of oral cancer in our regions. Or are we going to be stuck in observing routine basic oral pathology practice while the glorious cloud of precision oral health diagnostics is shifting. Thank you all so much for listening. And if you are ever in our Cape Town neighborhood, please do not hesitate to reach out so we can show you the beauties of the city. Yes, right. it was a wonderful lecture. Professor Joss, you can take over. And thank you, Henry. Can you please turn on your mic and camera? Right, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Professor Ariola actually is a good friend of mine, and uh, he's, he's part time lecturing in our department, and I'm very proud of uh, the dimension that he's bringing into our postgraduate training. 
So congratulations, uh, Thank you, Prof. Prof. Adiola, for uh, giving this overview. Um, I'm actually looking for questions, but I've got a few um, comments or, or remarks that I want to throw at you. Um, if you actually, for example, look the the translation of the, the knowledge that, for example, BRF um, is involved in immunoblastoma, has actually very quickly found itself into the use of immunohistochemistry. It didn't take more than two or three or four years for us to actually obtain um, an antibody that actually recognized the BRF protein. And we can actually diagnose a fair amount of amyoblastomas, especially in the, in the mandible, a bit less in the maxilla. So there's a good example already of a translation from genomics into practical application. Um, do you know of any other of these examples that we are already applying? Yeah, so um, I, I know very uh, definitely that many of these uh, approaches are ultimately going to reach uh, clinical utility. So the, the issue that uh, exists, particularly from, uh, for example, a, a genomic or a RNA sequencing uh, platform is the fact that it's some of those facts that I've listed relating to protein translation and, and, and uh, what we call translational control. So the fact that uh, an RNA transcript is identified to be upregulated uh, most of the time does not always translate to, to protein in, in such a way that it can lend itself to immunohistochemistry. So, so this is the reason why the, the profiling and even now applying things like systems biology uh, as well as data science is actually very key. Uh, we, we see it, for example, with inside to hybridization for RNA produced by HPV, uh, although it's not perfect, but that also was quite quickly developed, although it's not perfect. So uh, I have a question is, how would a, your vision apply to adenine cancer? Where would yeah, we so start? That, so that, yeah, so, so what, what I... What I think uh, is very important is that there has to be a buy-in from, from everyone. Um, you, you can just imagine that uh, a, a charismatic uh, organ, like when you try to make a fire, there has to be fire or a spark. There has to be a combustible material and the environment uh, has to be very favorable. So it's only then that you can, if any of the three factors are not present, then it's, it's most likely you're not going to have that nice barbecue or bride that you're trying to make. So, so basically where I'm going with that is that um, it's not only the, 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 the knowledge that is important, but I think it's actually the transformation of that knowledge to benefit. And this is why I think this platform is actually a very, very uh, good uh, opportunity to be able to uh, be in contact with as many of our colleagues as possible uh, and also to kind of beginning to have a futuristic thought uh, around uh, establishing precision oral, oral pathology, uh, precision oral medicine program, uh, such that we kind of move away from the supervised uh, sort of trained gestalt or, or patterns that are not, uh, uh, when, when, when you go into the realm of data science or, or artificial intelligence, they, they are not uh, the, the, the best uh, method. So, so we have to be able to kind of be, to have a hidden uh, region of our analysis so that we can have more true or supervised clusters, uh, which will kind of map to uh, personalized and more precise uh, diagnosis of disease. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a few questions about an interest about the eye knife. So you actually mentioned it has been used for, or well, your clip for resection of breast uh, carcinoma. Uh, do you think that uh, there are already programs um, in the world that are used for, let's say, tongue resection 
or um, let's say other head and neck restrictions? I'm not aware so, of so for, so 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 uh, you you know I, I tend to be kind of uh, nosy when it comes to things like this. So I've been following up on the REMS INAF study, uh, which is called Ray Size, Re, Ray Excise. Uh, it's a multi-center prospective, non-randomized feasibility study, and they they basically uh, have about 158 participants that were enrolled in about three centers. Uh, and uh, I, I see that the study officially ended in December 2021. So they've used it quite a lot for breast cancer, of course, because of the fact that the breast is, is external and, and easy to access. And so is the tongue as well, uh, if you think of it in a sense. But I know that they've also tried it for cervical cancer and they had almost a 100% accuracy uh, in, in terms of diagnosis of, of, of these cancers. I can see a problem with uh, field cancerization. Uh, you may have a d distinct carcinoma of the tongue, but we do know that um, because of the, the patient history of smoking, there might be general changes all over the mucosa. And the question is, which of these molecules are you going to pick up to actually found uh, that are positive of uh, either uh, or let's say, predictive of recurrence or are actually indicating that the tumor is not completely excised. Because we also know that a lot of these changes are occurring in the stroma long before there is an epithelial change. And I think that's a big problem in head and neck cancer. What do you think? It's, it's very interesting that you mentioned that because I, I think uh, the, the, the devil is in the details, right? So if we, if we think about uh, field cancerization, it is even one of the more important reasons why um, uh, the classical model of just taking uh, normal and abnormal uh, tissue from a cancerous area and kind of genetically or molecularly profiling them to, to find differences is, may not be uh, a plausible approach, you know. So, so uh, field cancerization in the oral cavity is a, is a major issue that can actually uh, be a, a, a discounting factor to, to, to the benefit of, of using the eye knife. Uh, for example, uh, as you've seen in some of the slides that I've shown, uh, there is what is called molecular evolution of, of, of mutational profile, whereby you can, uh, as, the, as, the, as the tumor progresses, different uh, mutation is present. So if the, if, the, if the machine is not trained to kind of be able to pick up cancerous signatures of fingerprints, and at the same time, fingerprints of pre-cancer or potentially malignant areas, then we would kind of sign them off and say, oh, clear, you're, you're good to go. And then there's going to be, of course, a recurrence. So uh, it, it's a very, very important point that you have brought forward. Right. I'm actually looking for more questions. Are there anybody who would like to ask Professor Adiola something specific? I, I, we've been thinking, for example, with salivary gland tumors now that we've actually identified this fusion of certain genes in, in, and that results in a certain phenotype of, of cancers. And I have heard uh, several experts already saying is that, well, that doesn't look like uh, the phenotype of an uh, EKTV fusion. Um, they don't look like that. Do you think that the reverse can also be applied where we are starting to understand, let's say, the molecular basis for a particular cancer or disease, and then retranslating that back to what actually is most available to us, which is microscopy or, or, or phenotype recognition? So in other words, it's a reverse. That's 
Oh, okay. So, so that's a very, very interesting question because I think this is one of the take home that uh, that I would wish that our colleagues would take uh, with them from here. That the very, very almost uh, uh, straight translation of of transcripts in terms of gene expression to protein does not always obtain. So, so uh, the, and this is where multi-level, multi-modal, multi-scale analysis comes to play. So, because the, the complement of genes that are expressed at any time uh, do not always automatically uh, translate to to a protein profile or to phenotype. So the, the, the profile of protein that you have at any given time is actually a product of the need of the body at that time. So for instance, so I can give you a very clear example. Uh, digestive enzymes are only important when you have just had your meal. Just imagine a scenario where digestive enzymes are there the whole time. So you would find the, the gene expressed but you would also find that the protein is, for example, glycosylated because it has to be post-transitionally modified to prevent it from uh, carrying out its destructive action in a scenario where there is no food. So uh, we, we, the, I think that the most important thing is to acquaint uh, ourselves as caregivers with the deeper knowledge of um, what really happens? What, 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 in what cases would I request for a, a genetic uh, uh, investigation? And in which cases is a protein or a phenotype uh, investigation more appropriate? So, 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 so this is the, the thing uh, where we, we, we don't want to say this is the marker for, for, for example, if we said P16 was marker for, for HPV positive oropharyngeal cancers. We also know that P, P, P16 is, is, is a marker uh, that is really, it's a cycling dependent kinase inhibitor. So we, if we look at a problem in, a, in only one dimension, we actually miss out on some of the other key uh, knowledge and information that we can glean from a multi, uh, a mechanistic and a multi-dimensional view of, of the problem. That's right. Um, let's have a look. Uh, and, and I've got one last thing for you. We discussed a while ago the usefulness of brush cytology uh, and the analysis of methylation of, of what is being obtained from the cells with a transepithelial brush biopsy. How far do you think we are from um, dividing a methodology where we can obtain a fairly quick result on, on methylation profiles. So, so, so liquid, liquid biopsy is, uh, is hot spot right now. Um, and and I, I think that all the diagnostic substrates should not really be compartmentalized. So that means uh, liquid biopsy can actually also be, uh, for example, uh, LBC, the, the, the ba liquid based cytology, uh, whereby you can use uh, a, a, a manifold approach to look at, for example, genomics profile, methylation profile, because basically what you have is the medium and the, and the cells that have been exfoliated from the surface of the tumor. So, so, so uh, liquid-based cytology lends itself so beautifully. And uh, uh, I, I have seen that uh, it is actually something that is potentially very practical in low uh, resource settings. Uh, and it also can, can cut the final or the ultimate costs of uh, managing disease, especially when they are not picked up early. So I, I think liquid-based cytology can be very, can lend itself very beautifully to methylome analysis, to epigenomics analysis, to proteome analysis, and to a myriad of other analysis. Right. Well, it is time for uh, concluding your uh, contribution. I, I thank you on behalf of everybody for an absolutely clear and wonderful uh, entertaining actually lecture. And I hope that a lot of our eyes will be open and start reflecting 
uh, in our own situations, uh, how we can start applying some of these, even if it's on a simple basis, uh, but uh, that are not that are cost effective and that actually would help a large number of, of, of patients that are uh, in the resource uh, underprivileged countries. So thank you very much from the organizing committee and from myself. Thank, thanks so much, Prof. Thank the, you. the pleasure is mine. Thanks for the mentorship. Thanks, Professor Donohue. It's nice to meet you. <laughs> yes, it's nice to meet thank you, you too. Actually, for the All first right, time, bye. yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I hope you can stay on you. for some what longer. Thank you I'll, so I'll much. I'll be here. I'll be here. Yes, and okay. we have your certificate, which I will share in a minute. Uh, that was a wonderful Thanks presentation. So and of course, as always, wrapped up and done exceptionally well, co covering it by Professor Hit. Exceptional. Thank you so much, both of you. I shall just I, share. I appreciate that. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, is that being seen? Yes, I think so. Okay. So thank you. And uh, I do realize there are some more questions, uh, which if everybody stays on till the end, we will have a few minutes that we will be able to uh, take whatever questions are left right at the end. In the meanwhile, uh, Give me a minute to go on to the next program. Okay, yes. So we have next, uh, we will be moving on to the quiz. But uh, before that, we have one small video that's been made by our um, co-organizers and partners, uh, the Vaidhi Dental College. It's made by their interns, in fact. So we are looking forward to sharing it with you. And um, just give me a minute to do that. That was wonderful, actually. I, I guess it's been a long time, but almost all of us can relate to the time when we are so enthusiastic and in love with our colleges and the places we study. And uh, I could really see that in that presentation. It was uh, really nice. Uh, you can congratulate your interns from me. And I guess some of them are actually logged in. So congratulations to you all. And uh, with that, I have to also say, I think in the beginning, I was meaning to say this, but we sort of got slightly derailed. 
So I have to say this, that uh, Vede Dental College, this is, uh, they have been with us through different uh, events actually before also, through both the international conferences and now this time this event. And, uh, you know, there is a lot of talk about how colleges don't uh, value oral pathology. But I, I have an interesting experience that whenever I have asked and approached an institute, whether within India or outside, always the college has stepped in and has actually helped and supported, which was why we had so much of support uh, even for the conference. So I think uh, there's, a, there's a lot of hope. There's a lot of appreciation of oral pathology and oral medicine for that matter. It, it's just that maybe we don't get uh, to... Uh, what should I say, to realize it, but it's there. It's very much there. Okay, with that, I'll stop talking. Uh, Dr. Selvi, you can take over and introduce Dr. Anita. Uh, you're on mute. Thank you, Mandana. Yeah, you are, uh, what you are saying is very true. Uh, we have been lucky. Our management has been quite supportive of all the programs that we have gone and asked permission for, and this was one of it. And so, yeah, so we'll continue with the next program and that is today's quiz program. Uh, it has been arranged by Dr. Anita Spadigam and her team from Goa Medical, sorry, Goa Dental College, the government dental college. And Dr. Anita, Sp Anita Spadigam is professor and head. Uh, she has more than 30 years of experience and she's heading the department of oral pathology. She has also come as a senior expert, also as a presenter in this channel. So I call upon Dr. Anita Spadigan to please join and start the next session. Oh, one second. Apparently she is muted. I, I'll just... Uh... Good evening, everyone. Cheers to Oral Pathology 360 on its second glorious anniversary. Here is a quiz that's brought to you from the Department of Oral and Maxillofacial Pathology at the Goa Dental College and Hospital. My colleagues, Dr. Carla Carvalho and Dr. Anupama Mukherjee have enjoyed every minute of putting up this fun test of all that is pathological, pattern recognition, terminology, and embedded clues in a three round quiz that we have titled as Round Pathoglyphics, Round two is word up and round three is path hunt. Now the rules for each round will be displayed on your screens and you need to send your answers to all three rounds in one message to the link that has been provided for quiz responses. Please do not send more than one message and do add your name in the message because that will identify you as a potential prize winner. Now round one is a qualifier round. You get all 10 answers right then and only then do we go ahead and check your responses to rounds two and three. So the first all correct responses will be the winner of this quiz. The time at which the responses are clocked in will be the decisive factor. So get your digits device ready and get those answers out here as quickly as you can. Good luck to all of you.
want to try my luck at it. <laughs> okay. And by the way, everybody, the link is also given here below. And I will appreciate it if one of my co-hosts who has the link can share it uh, in the chat because I'm somehow not able to open my own uh, saved document right now with everything on my screen. Yes, we are almost at the end. Uh, Mandana, there is yeah. a query from um, a YouTube uh, um, moderator whether this um, quiz is for them also. Yes, yes, very much so. But it has not been shared over there. The, you can see it. It's on the screen. Uh, uh, even in YouTube, she is saying, uh, Dr. Nandini, please yeah, come it in. It is on the screen. It is very much on the screen. I can see it here in my... Yeah, everybody on YouTube, you can also answer the queries. I mean, I'll take part in the quiz. And the link has to be shared, the WhatsApp link. Uh, Dr. Nandini, I had shared that link with you all. Can you share it from that WhatsApp group? If you can take that link and put it on the Hello. chat. Yes, that is over. So I hope you enjoyed that quiz, everybody. And we move on to our next session for which our moderator for the second lecture on the oral cancer update is a keen clinical oral pathologist and a passionate academician with more than 25 years of experience. She is Dr. Karpaga Selvi, professor and head at the Department of Oral Pathology, the Vaidehi Institute of Dental Sciences and Research Center at Bangalore. Dr. Karpaga Selvi is a recognized guide for both the PhD and MDS programs. Besides being a recipient of grants from the ICMR and the RGUHS for her research in the field of oral pathology. Over to you, Dr. Karpaga Selvi. Uh, thank you, Anita. Uh, so we start with the next session. Uh, we request Dr. Amir to start with his topic. HPV in oral squamous cell carcinoma. Dr. Amir Afrobeth is the head of department of oral and maxillofacial pathology at the University of Western Cape, South Africa. He is principal specialist at the National Health Laboratory Service. Dr. Amir is the first oral pathologist to graduate from the prestigious Harvard Medical School and holds a fellowship in head and neck pathology from the same university. He is an international fellow of the College of American Pathologists and a member of the Endocrine Pathology Society. Dr. Amir's field of expertise covers a wide range of pathologies such as thyroid and oral cytopathology, HPV-induced cancers of the head and neck, and molecular pathogenesis of adenoid cystic carcinoma. His in-depth knowledge in the field of head and neck pathology is evidenced by his widely published research and his contribution to several pathology books. In recognition of his work, he has received numerous awards and prizes. He was one of the five cancer researchers nominated for the prestigious Otley Memorial Award of the Cancer Association of South Africa in 2019. The global incidence of HPV positive oropharyngeal and oral cancer is 33% and 3% respectively. Although published data is sparse, HPV positivity in these tumors seem to indicate a preference for economically developed as compared to developing countries. In the field of HPV-induced head and neck cancers, 
Dr. Amir's work has received a worthy international praise. We are all eager to hear about his evidence-based research, and so it is with great pleasure that I welcome Dr. Amir to deliver his lecture. Hello. Thank you very much, and um, it is really an honor to uh, be here, and thank you very much for inviting me to the University of Oral Pathology, India. Um, it is totally our pleasure, and uh, I have to just mention to everybody, this is Dr. Amir's third lecture today, so I don't know how uh, exhausted he is. He's been traveling and lecturing for the last few days, I think, so uh, it's really nice of you to be with us, and thank you so much. I will not Thank take more time. We are waiting to hear you. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So um, we know that there are two different pathways to, to, to head and neck cancer. And uh, the first pathway is actually um, direct damage to the DNA by tobacco associated mutations. And the second pathway is indirect uh, alteration of the DNA caused by viral proteins. And in case of each, uh, uh, human papillomavirus or E6 and E7 proteins, just a little bit about the uh, structure of the human papillomavirus. Human papillomavirus is an icosahedral shaped virus as witnessed by electron microscopy. Uh, it has got a very small genome. It consists of a double stranded circular DNA of eight kilobyte in size. The genome is very small. However, there is a lot of information that is, is, that is squeezed into the genome. The genome of the virus is protected by a capsid protein, as you can see, and the capsid protein is made up of capsomeres, namely L1 and L2 molecules. Looking at the structure of the, of the genome of the human papillomavirus, there are three regions of the open reading frames. One is the early region, as you can see, late control region, and the late region. All human papillomaviruses have four core proteins. These are E1 and E2 that are involved in replication and transcription of the virus, and L1 and L2 that are, that are major, and major, major and minor capsid proteins. Oncogenic human papillomaviruses such as HPV16 have got accessory proteins called E4, E5, E6, and E7. And these proteins are, interact with a plethora of, 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 of cellular proteins to, to encourage cellular proliferation and immune evasion. So this is a very nice table showing us um, the different functions of these proteins. E1 and E2 are, in, are involved in um, um, cellular transcription and replication. The E4 uh, protein destabilizes and disrupts the cellular cytokeratin filament network and by doing so results in virus release and transmission. E5 oncoprotein results in a stabilization of the epidermal growth factor receptor, and by doing so, it results in cellular proliferation. This is why drugs, um, and uh, th this is why drugs such as cetuzumab, which are known as um, EGFR blocking agents, have no uh, place in the treatment of HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas, and may even result in worse overall survival and more cancer recurrence than your conventional chemotherapeutic agents such as cisplatin. The E6 oncoprotein targets and degrades the P53 tumor suppressor protein and encourages and promotes cellular longevity and immortalization. It also has got a PDZ, PDZ binding motif site and the PDZ binding activity of the E6 results in expression of cyclin B and therefore cellular proliferation. So the E6 plays a very important role in cellular proliferation. E7 uh, targets and, um, and, and degrades the retinoblastoma tumor suppressor protein. And we all know that uh, the retinoblastoma protein is a break on the cell cycle. And once that break is released, we will have cellular proliferation. So the E6 and E7 play a very important role in, in, in cellular proliferation. The E7 also, what it does, it activates two histone dimethylase, demethylases, KDM6A and KDM6B, and that will result in activity of P16 and high expression of P16, which is known as the surrogate marker of high-risk HPV infection. The WHO has now classified 14 mucosal HPV types as high-risk, and these include your 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, 39, 45, 51, 52, 
56, 58, 59, and very recently 66 and 68. If you look at the top um, 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 graph, um, you will see all these cancers that are caused by high-risk human papilloma viruses, your cervical, vaginal, vulva, penile, anal, rectal, and oropharyngeal cancer. And you can see below that, um, in the blue um, 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 circles, that the blue actually is the HPV-16, and HPV-16 accounts for the uh, majority of these cancers. Indeed, in oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, as you can see, HPV accounts for at least 85% of all HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. Looking at the incidence of HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas, as you can see that uh, every year there are about 30,000 cases of newly diagnosed cases of oropharyngeal uh, HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, and about half of these actually occur in the United States of America and the UK. Indeed, in UK and the USA, um, um, the incidence of HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma has surpassed that of cervical cancer. Like I said, there is significant heterogeneity in terms of the prevalence of HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. Um, some countries show a very high incidence. Like we said, more than half of the cases actually occur in the United States of America and UK. Um, there are other countries that show a very low incidence, such as Southern India um, and Sub-Saharan Africa, which we, in which we have done a study. However, the rates are increasing in some other countries. For example, um, Lebanon has shown uh, an increasing incidence in the Middle East. Talking a little bit about the clinical profile of HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas, in, con in contrast to your conventional smoking and alcohol related uh, head and neck squamous cell carcinomas, the HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas are frequently observed in younger married males, which are usually less than 65 years old. They are of higher socioeconomic status and tend to drink or smoke less and report more oral sex partners. On radiological examination, these lesions are very well defined and small, as you can see on the PET-CD. However, they, uh, they, they usually present with very large nodal, uh, cystic nodal uh, neck metastases. Secondary primary tumors or local, local regional recurrences are infrequently seen with HPV positive oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. And this is usually due to the lack of the field cancerization effect because transcriptionally active P uh, HPV is not detected in the peritumoral mucosa. The HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas have got a very good response to radiotherapy, and this is linked to their unique molecular profile. The radiated HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma cells are more likely to undergo apoptosis due to activation of functional wild type P53 that is frequently mutated in HPV negative oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. And like we said, the E6 and the E7 of the virus encourage rapid progression of the radiation damaged cells through the, uh, through the cell cycle, allowing them to skip re DNA repair mechanisms, thereby enhancing their radio sensitivity. Overall, patients with HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma have a better clinical outcome, and this has been shown in a number of studies irrespective of the, of, the, of the heterogeneity of the popul patient populations in these studies, sample sizes, methods, and, and methods of HPV detection. Indeed, Gill indeed Gillison et al. were the first to report a 74% reduction in risk of death from cancer among patients with HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma in comparison to patients with HPV negative oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. And because of the survival benefit of these patients, uh, a few years ago, a newer staging system was um, developed um, uh, uniquely for uh, HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas that is now integrated into the American Joint Cancer Committee Cancer Staging Manual. Talking a little bit about the pathogenesis of HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, the epithelium that lines the crypts of the of the of, of the of the of the tonsil rests on a dense lymphoid stroma. The basement membrane in this area has got porosities or has got these discontinuities, which allows the free movement of lymphoid cells between the stroma and that of the epithelium. And uh, because of these breaks and discontinuities, the components of the basement membrane, such as heparin sulfate proteoglycans and laminin-5, uh, which are actually viral entry receptors for HPV, are exposed 
and HPV can easily gain access to these receptors. Another thing that is very important is that one may ask the question why the tonsil again? Uh, the other reason is that uh, the, the immune cells or the lymphoid cells in this region have got the PD-1, uh, their PD-1 receptors bind the PD-1 ligands that are located uh, on the surface of the basal cells. And this actually results them being inactive and incapable of uh, producing a response against high-risk human papilloma virus. So the tonsil is actually a very good immune privilege site uh, for, for high-risk HPV. Because of these uh, survival, survival benefit and, and, and the better outcome of patients with HPV or HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, it has become increasingly important uh, to, 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 to test these oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas for high risk HPV uh, because of the significant implications for patient prognostication and, and patient prognostication and management. So the College of American Pathology now strongly recommends high-risk HPV testing on all patients with newly diagnosed oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, including all histologic subtypes. Testing, testing may be done on the primary tumor or on a re regional lymph node metastases when the clinical findings are compatible with a primary oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. So you may ask, what is the ideal test? An ideal test should be highly specific. It should be very sensitive. It should be practical. It should be inexpensive and strongly prognostic. There are a number of tests uh, there for high-risk HPV. One of them, and the most popular one, is the DNA polymerase chain reaction. The DNA PCR is a highly sensitive test because it will amplify even a small quantities of DNA. However, it's not as specific as you cannot localize, visually localize HPV DNA to tumor cells. On the other hand, your DNA in situ hybridization um, is a highly specific test because you can visually localize um, um, the, the DNA of the high-risk HPV virus to the tumor cells, but on the, on the other hand, it's not very sensitive because it cannot detect low quantities of DNA. We have come to know that the mRNA uh, in situ hybridization or mRNA-ish is actually the gold standard for the detection of high-risk um, HPV virus. This is because it's a very highly um, specific test because um, you can visually localize um, uh, the mRNA transcripts of the high-risk HPV virus to the tumor cells. And also the transcription process creates an, uh, creates a, an amplification step and that actually increases uh, the, the sensitivity of these tests. Um, this is actually um, um, one of the early um, uh, uh, mRNA-ish uh, tests that was done by one of my colleagues, Dr. Darcy Kier, when I was studying at Massachusetts General Hospital as a fellow. And um, you can see how beautiful the test is. Uh, you can actually appreciate the red signals, which are the um, high-risk HPV E6 and E7 mRNA transcripts uh, that you can visualize under the microscope. However, what about P16? Now, P16 has got a very good sensitivity. It has got a sensitivity of almost 100%. Its specificity is also good, and it's actually more than 90%. And now the College, the College of American Pathologists actually recommends that uh, P16 is actually sufficient uh, to confirm um, um, uh, the, uh, the presence of high-risk HPV in oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. Also in metastases to the, to the level two and level three regional lymph nodes with the non-keratinizing morphology, P16 is sufficient to confirm the presence of high-risk HPV in the oropharynx. However, P16 does have its limitations outside or, or, oropharynx. Um, not all the time P16 expression equals, the, uh, equals um, a high-risk HPV. Um, we, did, we did a study on periocular sebaceous carcinomas um, um, a few years ago. And we found that these cancers actually show high expression of P16, but when you investigate them with very sensitive and specific methods, such as mRNA-ish, they are negative for high-risk HPV. These are good examples of P16 positivity. You can see that uh, um, strong positivity of the P16 in an oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, it should be positive in um, more than 70% of the cells showing both cytoplasmic and nuclear positivity. And on the right-hand side, you see the DNA-ish, and you can see the blue signals in the tumor cells, which is the viral, uh, high-risk HPV viral DNA. However, sometimes with DNA-ish, we do have problems 
uh, like a, such as background staining, which may complicate interpretation. So based on its outstanding performance, we're talking about P16 on a small tissue samples, its practicality, and the wealth of literature implicating P16 as an independent predictor of survival in oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma patients. The College of American Pathologists now recommends high-risk HPV testing by surrogate marker of P16 for oropharyngeal and non-cytology tissue specimens. This is a CAP group that was convened um, 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 a few years ago, uh, and uh, it was made up of pathologists, as you can see. There were also some um, um, uh, ENT surgeons with an interest in high-risk HPV in that group, such as James Rocco. And what they did, they came up with their recommendations in the form of an algorithm, and I'm sure you have all read that. Talking about association between high-risk HPV and head and neck cancer sites, for the oropharynx, this association is quite as strong, it's 80 to 90%. For the sinonasal cavity, it's somewhere in the region of 20 to 25%. And for the oral cavity proper, this association is very low and is somewhere between three and 6%. For the larynx, it's less than 5%. And for the other head and neck sites, such as preocular cancers, we did a study back in um, uh, 2016, uh, looking at the presence of high-risk HPV in conjunctival as well as lacrimal sacrosquamous cell carcinomas. And we found that 30% of those cancers are indeed associated with high-risk HPV using the same guidelines of those of College of American Pathologies using P16 as a screening test, followed up by, uh, uh, followed up, uh, uh, following up the P16 positive cases with a PCR. So actually what we found is that uh, probably the preocular cancers uh, or the preocular region is the second most common site after the uh, oral pharynx um, as the highest uh, site that is linked with high-risk HPV. And in these uh, cancers, again, HPV-16 plays a very important role, and HPV-18 uh, uh, and some other, uh, others, such as HPV-33 and 52, play a minor role. So the oral pharynx is the only head and neck site where there is a strong evidence-based information linking high-risk HPV to improved outcome. However, this is not equal for all sites in the oropharynx. Um, the association is very strong for the tonsillar areas, as well as the base of tongue being 92%. And for the soft palate and posterior pharyngeal wall, this is actually less and it's about 3%. And this is, has got implications for radiotherapy and site-specific targeted therapy for high-risk HPV. So what is the morphology of these uh, uh, HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas? Uh, a lot of them have got a non-keratinizing morphology. Uh, however, there are also other can, can, uh, squamous cell carcinomas, uh, variants of squamous cell carcinomas that do occur in the oropharynx that are associated with high-risk HPV, such as papillary squamous cell carcinoma and adenosquamous carcinoma adenocarcinoma, and a, small, a, a percentage of the small cell carcinomas of the oropharynx, um, about 5 to 10 percent, have been linked to high-risk HPV. But one should remember that the small cell carcinomas are not associated with improved outcome, and they are uniformly lethal. In the sinonasal cavity, we said that about 25 percent of these cancers are linked to high-risk HPV. There were some important types that were um, uh, linked uh, new types that were described and linked to high-risk HPV, such as carcinoma with adenocystic uh, carcinoma-like features that I will discuss a little bit later. And uh, also a group of Schneiderian carcinomas and their variants are linked with high-risk, have been linked to high-risk HPV. So this is a classic look of or morphology, histomorphology of a tumor uh, in the oral pharynx um, of, uh, that is HPV positive. They have got these, um, they show these lobular growth pattern. Um, they have got, they are, they are quite, these islands are quite basophilic. They are made up of these basophilic cells that show a very high NC ratio. Uh, there are areas of comedotype necrosis and they are associated with a very dense lymphoid stroma. And when you do a P16, you can see that P16 is positive in more than 70% of the tumor cells showing both cytoplasmic and nuclear positivity. These tumors, these HPV positive tumors that we see in the oropharynx, the squamous cell carcinomas, we do not grade them. We rather call them HPV positive or P16 positive squamous cell carcinomas. So please do not grade them according to the grading systems of well differentiated, moderately differentiated, or poorly differentiated. You can just simply call them HPV positive or P16 positive squamous cell carcinomas. This is an example of a um, papillary squamous cell carcinoma of the oropharynx that was linked with high risk, uh, that was associated with high-risk HPV. 
And then there was a new variant that was um, 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 not uh, um, um, introduced not so long ago by um, the group at Pittsburgh, uh, uh, Professor Roger Sitella, um, and uh, they showed uh, a new variant that is uh, high risk HPV associated for the uh, non keratinizing cystic uh, ciliated, non keratinizing ciliated adenosquamous carcinoma that can very closely mimic your um, mucopidermal carcinoma. So you should be wary of that. And when you do a P16 on them, they are positive. Like I said, in the sinonasal tract, the, um, the, the group from John Hopkins Hospital, Justin Bishop and their team showed a new um, um, cancer called the multi-phenotypic sinonasal carcinoma that has got a very close resemblance to adenoid cystic carcinoma. Indeed, they have got also the same immunophenotype, both cancers being CD117 positive. However, the multi-phenotypic sinonasal carcinoma is negative for the MYB gene alteration that has been described in adenoid cystic carcinoma. And um, these, can uh, these cancers are usually associated with high-risk HPV types 33 and 35, something that we do not see with adenoid cystic carcinoma. So you can see closely how closely these cancers actually do mimic adenoid cystic carcinoma. They show these cryptoform architecture. They are uh, uh, however, they are, however, they are positive for, 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 for P16 here, and um, um, even they can be positive for CD117, like I said. Okay. However, that on morphology, there can be a bit of a difference. Um, the uh, multi-phenotypic sinonasal carcinomas are more um, uh, um, strange looking, they are more polymorphic in comparison to adenoid cystic carcinoma, and usually they show areas of um, high-grade dysplasia. So, so when you examine these cancers, make sure that you examine them very carefully for areas of high-grade dysplasia. So we went on, our group went on to look at the prevalence of um, um, HPV-positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, we did this study at Tigerberg Hospital, which is one of the major um, 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 referral hospitals in the region. Uh, we looked at oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas from 2007 to 2017. And uh, we um, went according to the College of American Pathologists recommendations, used P16 as a screening test. In cases that were P16 positive, we followed, that, we followed those up with the BD Viper PCR system. And uh, um, our study was published in the um, Archives of Pathology last year. This is the, um, um, the journal of the College of American Pathologists. And indeed, we showed a very low prevalence uh, for the high-risk HPV in, in this region, a prevalence of almost 5%. Uh, many of these cancers, like at his, at, as it has been described in literature, were non-keratinizing or partially keratinizing. Again, HPV-16 was the main causative agent here. And however, we did see a, 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 a case of a high-risk HPV-52, 18, and 31 also, which may have actually implications for current uh, vaccination, vaccination strategies in the region. What was also very interesting in our study was that we saw um, 200 and odd cases, and of those cases, 23 were P16 positive. However, when we followed up these P16 positive cases with PCR, only 13 proved to be associated with high-risk HPV, and therefore P16 had a very low positive predictive value of 36%. So it shows that P16 is actually not a very good surrogate marker of high-risk HPV infection, in, 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 low prevalence, in low prevalence areas such as ours, and P16 should be followed by an HPV confirmatory test. And I think the results of our study will perhaps influence the guidelines of the College of American Pathologies um, um, later on. You may ask that why uh, we might have had a low prevalence of high-risk HPV. This is because the Tigerberg Hospital, where we're practicing, um, um, he um, serves people of African descent, people of more low socioeconomic status. They usually have a history of tobacco and alcohol smoking, and uh, they possibly report less all sex partners in comparison to the peoples that you see in the private centers. So this could be the reason why we are showing a, a lower prevalence of this virus. I'm sure you all know that uh, oral sex is uh, the number one and the most important risk factor or high risk um, um, yeah, HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. 
talking a little bit about prevention, um, um, uh, in 2014 in South Africa, two types of vaccines were rolled out, uh, Gardasil and Cervarix. And both of these cancers protect you against uh, uh, um, high-risk HPV type 16 and 18, which is great because we said that HPV 16 actually accounts for the majority of these cancers. But also in the study, we showed that there are also some smaller types uh, can occur like 52, 31, uh, and 33. And um, therefore, it is might be a better, better strategy to use uh, a, a, a vaccine such as Gardasil 9 that provides a broader spectrum of uh, high risk, it provides protection against the broadest spectrum of high risk HPV viruses. It is maybe also uh, an ideal strategy uh, to, to, to vaccinate um, not only girls, but vaccinate boys too, because um, not all the girls around the world are vaccinated. And I know that uh, countries such as Australia have started their um, uh, gender neutral um, vaccination. And um, they are, it, is, it is still very soon to, to speculate about the results of those vaccination strategies. However, there are already reports showing, showing very good and um, effect, a very good prevention and effectiveness against um, um, oral HPV positive oral pharyngeal squamosarcoma. So, what is new in the field of um, HPV positive oral pharyngeal squamosarcoma? A subset of these cancers can show uh, positivity for estrogen receptor expression, and it has been shown that th those uh, subset of cancers that are positive for estrogen receptor have even a better survival rate. So um, the research in this area is also ongoing. So maybe in the near future, the oncologist might ask the pathologist to do an estrogen receptor expression, and maybe some of these cancers can be treated by uh, uh, drugs that can block estrogen receptors, such as the drugs that we use more commonly for breast cancer, such as tamoxifen. Um, there was a recent study that came out about uh, um, uh, uh, two or three months ago in June, and that was by um, um, Dr. James Lewis, looking at, uh, and, and this was a, a research that he did on human papillomavirus associated oral cavity squamous cell carcinomas. We said that the prevalence of high-risk HPV in oral cavity squamous cell carcinomas is very low in the region of three to 5%, but nobody has yet conclus uh, had conclusively uh, shown the histomorphology of these cancers. And he went on to show, so I can, talk a little bit about the summary of what he, he, he found. He found that these HPV positive oral squamous cell carcinomas commonly involve the ventral surface of the tongue and floor of mouth. They show a non-keratinizing morphology similar to your HPV positive oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma with variable foci of keratinocytic maturation. These cancers are associated with extensive foci of oral squamous cell carcinoma in situ with a basaloid or a boenoid morphology. They were all seen in men, just similar to your HPV positive oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. However, in contrast to HPV positive oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas, they were strongly associated with alcohol and tobacco consumption. And also in contrast to HPV positive cancers where they had um, a, a good survival, these HPV positive oral squamous cell carcinomas are very aggressive and they even show inferior survival and many of them show positive margins on surgery. That may be also important to recognize these cancers because you can tell the surgeon that look, um, the, the biopsy shows a HPV positive um, oral pharyngeal, uh, correction, oral squamous cell carcinoma, and they can be more um, aggressive in terms of the treatment, um, giving them the go ahead that many of these cancers uh, may have positive margins. And then um, not, not very long ago, um, 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 the group at uh, the Foden group at Massachusetts General Hospital, um, um, we know that about 10 to 20 percent of HPV positive um, uh, um, uh, oral squamous cell carcinoma patients uh, can have local regional recurrences. And these patients usually do very bad and they can develop metastases. So is there a way that we can monitor, monitor these cases? and we can also monitor response to treatment and we can monitor progression of the disease. And the Fallen group um, um, at Massachusetts General Hospital um, not so long ago found um, that uh, the circulating HPV DNA in the blood is actually a very good bio, liquid biomarker for, um, uh, for, for, for high-risk HPV. And um, it showed a very good sensitivity and the specificity. Indeed, if you wanna read a little bit more on that, um, the, um, 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 Professor James Rocco, uh, the ENT surgeon, has published um, 
a review on that, the future of circulating tumor DNA as a biomarker in HPV related oropharyngeal squamous cell um, um, carcinoma. So a very good way to, to um, monitor progression of disease and response to treatment. Before I conclude the lecture, I would like to uh, speak to you about one other entity, you know, as uh, the, um, the spectrum of high-risk HPV tumors is, is expanding, we have got a new entity, and this entity is gaining more recognition called the human papillomavirus associated combined neuroendocrine and a squamous cell carcinoma of the sinonasal tract. As the name implies, it's a tumor that shows both neuroendocrine features and uh, the, the neuro neuroendocrine areas, as you can see on the, on the right side, are made up of large and smaller uh, neuroendocrine cells, and they are positive for your common neuroendocrine markers, such as synaptophysin and chromogranin. And then it also shows areas of conventional squamous cell carcinoma, as you can see, strongly positive for P63 and CK5. But when you do a P16, the entire tumor stains very well. You can see it there at the bottom uh, center that the, the, the entire tumor stains you know, quite strongly with, uh, with P16, more than 70% both nuclear and cytoplasmic. And when you follow um, um, your P16 positivity with, with uh, your high-risk um, HPV tests, it was confirmed that they are positive for high-risk HPV. Like I said, we still don't know much about this tumor. And if you do see it, just be, be aware of it. And um, uh, which, when we have a good cohort of these cases, we can then um, um, speculate about their behavior in the head and neck region. And with that, I would like to conclude my uh, lecture. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Um, uh, that was a very good presentation. You covered almost all the aspects of uh, HPV, starting from pathogenesis to the, uh, the uh, molecular basis, as well as the prevention. And you also touched upon the HPV associated other lesions of uh, head and neck region. So, there are a few queries already raised um, and I think I'll just go to them and then come back. Uh, Dr. Garima, you wanted to ask some qu question? No. I think there is some confusion. Okay. Possible. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Amir, how frequent do you see uh, HPV-associated oral squamous cell carcinoma, purely oral, without talking about oral pharyngeal carcinoma? Um, practice, yeah. Uh, well, you know, I was um, um, more focused about HPV positive or pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas. I mean, back then when I did my fellowship at Massachusetts General Hospital, um, it was I was quite um, aware of them. And at the time, um, because of the low prevalence of 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 um, of, of um, um, HPV positive or squamous cell carcinomas, and uh, also because of the fact that uh, we didn't know much about the morphology of these lesions, I never pursued them. So, um, so uh, now that uh, this uh, um, article came out about uh, a, a, a month ago or two months ago in June, I'll be more vigilant of, of HPV positive oral squamous cell carcinomas. I know that uh, the first person who actually described um, oral squamous cell carcinoma in situ in the oral cavity that is high risk HPV positive was Dr. Supin Wu but it was not really accepted by a lot of head and neck pathologists at the time. And now it has really um, yeah, gained a bit of um, importance now. So I will be very vigilant about them from now on. And um, I was actually thinking of doing a study looking at, uh, um, at these cases um, to, to see if we can add more to the, to, to, to the literature because that was one of the recommendations from Dr. James Lewis that maybe more um, um, more studies are needed so that we can we can accurately um, class uh, we can accurately describe the morphology of uh, these lesions and their behaviors. So, uh, so would it help going back and retrieving the cases which have specifically occurred on the ventral surface of the tongue and floor of the mouth? As such, these lesions are very rare. These sites we see very rarely. Yes, yes. 
So, but and specifically if those morphology as which has been described in this recent article, would it help if you we can retrieve and maybe subject them? Exactly. That is actually what I'm also thinking about doing this 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 study. I even indicated to 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 Professor William um, Facon, my uh, my mentor at, at at MGH, that if they are, would like to collaborate with us on this on on, on this project. Like you said, it's they are very rare flora of mouth and 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 uh, ventral exactly. surface of the tongue cancers. I mean, we can look at those with with a similar morphology, having a non keratinizing and the inside tubes that have got these boino type of appearance and we can do a P16 and test them for, yeah. Yeah, it would be a very good idea. So now there have been some of uh, queries which have come in the chat box. Uh, I would read them out. Dr. Nasser Said has said, um, great lecture, HPV related oropharyngeal carcinoma and TNM staging generally lower or higher. Some studies, especially latter favors lesser. I hope you're yeah. getting the question. Yes, I got the question. So I, I go for the lesser. <laughs> so it has been um, it has been uh, staged for the lesser than the higher. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Garima Rawat wants to know what method was used for P16 positivity grading, or I think she means P16 positivity rather than grading. Oh yes, for the P60 positivity, obviously, um, 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 you look at uh, like as it has been recommended, you need to see more than seventy percent cytoplasmic and nuclear positivity. But again, you know there are some cases that are a little bit indeterminate. You are not very sure. They show about fifty percent, sixty percent. And there was a there was a recent article that came out uh, that I read with it, which I did not mention here. Those in indeterminate cases, actually, a lot of them land up to be high risk HPV positive. So if you're seeing cases that are like you, you sometimes see cases that are like 50, 60, or even those, 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 you are not really sure and you're indeterminate P16, then um, you can confirm them by doing a confirmatory test. Because the literature has shown a lot of these indeterminate cases land up to be positive. Thank you, Doc. There is one oh, question from sorry, Dr. Sarve. Yeah. Uh, I will just have uh, allowed everyone to turn their camera and their mic on since we have time. Yeah. So if they want to have the discussion, they can just uh, turn ask. on your camera and mic and yeah, ask your question. Dr. Garima, I believe you have a question. You can turn on your mic and uh, camera. Yeah. Dr. Garima, go ahead. And please ask. No, I don't think she is. Uh... Okay, you go on and ask. I will see if they can join in. Mohammed Jisim, would you like to ask? Or actually, he wants to know whether there are other factors which enhances HPV in oral cancer. I think yeah, Dr. Mohammed is Dr. here. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Yes, you can ask your question. Hello. Hi. My question is, uh, what are the other factors which enhance the HPV in oral cancer? Other factors that can, um, you mean risk factors or you mean... Um, yes, risk factors. What are the risk factors? Because I have also done thesis on HPV 16 and 18 in, in role of oral cancer. <laughs> yes. So, 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 so there are also a number of other studies that show other factors. Um, I'm not sure about HPV positive oropharyngeal squamous or carcinomas. I'm not sure about. Uh, I, I don't have a very good insight into HPV positivity. Uh, I, I mean, sorry, in in um, HIV positivity, HIV positive patients. There can be another risk factors that they say it's it's the uh, HIV virus. And that has been linked with a lot of. Uh, I remember they, in the study that I did in the eye cancers. That were, but some, um, that were, but uh, some, some research shows there is a oral sex and other things like tobacco and oral sex, uh, uh, they also enhance the HPV. What enhances HPV? Sorry, how is HPV? Like, like, like I said, HIV may enhance the activity of, of, of HPV. That, that is one um, uh, thing that has been proposed. And the one that you are suggesting, sorry, I didn't catch you. I, okay, sir, no, no issue. Thank you. <laughs> Dr. Sure. Mohit, can you go ahead and ask yes. your query? 
Uh, sir, one uh, I had read. Uh, actually, I would admit my uh, uh, knowledge about HPV-related oral cancer is not much. But I read one article in Oral Oncology where it said that most of the uh, HPV-related OSCC, uh, it's seen that the virus is transitionally inactive. Uh, like the E6 and E7 expression, we are not able to uh, find uh, positive expression. And it may be like uh, they said a hit and run case of uh, this malignancy. So how can we like actually confirm whether it was a HPV related malignancy or like it is just a bystander there? Okay, so, so in order for you to show the virus, you need to show the virus in its transcriptionally active state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes. um, Yes. So, so, so um, for that, you need, um, um, like I said, P16 has been shown in the oral pharynx to correlate with the presence of the transcriptionally active virus. And that's why the College of American Pathologists has recommended that P16 only is sufficient for that. But like I said, for, uh, for, for in terms of our population here and in low prevalence areas, maybe also India and ours, we should follow that up with a confirmatory test. So your question is very right. You know, sometimes a high risk HPV in the oral cavity can just be a passenger infection. Some of those cancers can just be a, 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 a transit or a passenger infection. So you need to show the virus in its, in its transcription in the active state. Yeah. So one more question, sir. Sir, there yes. is one entity called, which has been proposed in the past, called chylocytic dysplasia. So mm -hmm. I was more interested in the these uh, OPMDs, like uh, detecting these OPMDs. So what is the status of this uh, chylocytic dysplasia means? It is um, mainly the uh, severe dysplasia along with the chylocytic changes. So means, can we use it as a means? So, so from, from what I remember, this was a term that was used by a lot of uh, old pathologists, cholecytic dysplasia, and... Uh, I think the term is redundant now. I think some other people might come and um, shed some light on that. Uh, but uh, we do see cholecytes here and there at times in a lot of uh, lesions in oral cavity. So the term cholecytic dysplasia, I'm not sure if it is still a stands or is it a redundant term? Maybe a head and neck pathologist can assist us here also with that. Okay, sir. Thank it's you. a term that I don't use in practice usually. <laughs> okay. So it's still a debatable term right now. Hi, Dr. Amir. Thank you very much for the splendid inf information. I, I have a passion for the same HPV in our carcinogenesis. I think- You're welcome, uh, um, Prof. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. I think the staging issue is because of the high incidence of lymph nodes yeah. detected, everybody's confused about the lower stage. It's actually yeah. at a lower stage up per the WHO, but because of the presence of high lymph node uh, at the time of detection, everybody is trying, trying to gear it toward a bad, bad outcome, but it's actually it's a better outcome, like you mentioned, response yeah. better to radiation, lower That's dose right. of radiation, RTOG, RTOG studies in the beginning showed That's that. Right. Yeah. But um, my, I think my confusion is people mix oral with oral pharyngeal. I, I don't believe it exists in the oral. Um, I don't think it's an existing pure oral. I think when we see people talk about oral, they, they mentioned oral with the oral pharyngeal together, and that's not correct. That's not oral correct. Yes, I also agree with you on that. Yeah. Different. There should be a clear line question. between the two. Yes. Thank you, sir. My last question yeah. is what do you think about the salivary gland tumors uh, involvement with, yes. with HPV? Dr. Skolovo, which you know very well, um, yes. has. Kind of geared toward against them. Uh, we did a Mount Sinai, um, we did a study and showed high grade mucoviderma carcinoma, integrated genomic HPV, and those tumors were very, very highly positive and reliable. Um, where, do, where do you stand? Since you mentioned sebaceous carcinoma, it could be negative. I just want to see where do you stand with your expertise yeah. from. So so, so, my, so my experience with high-risk HPV in, in, in salivary gland uh, carcinomas, I have had, uh, uh, we, we looked at adenocystic carcinomas of the lacrimal gland, and uh, we showed that, uh, um, I mean, we used the same type of recommendations that the College of American Pathologists 
using P16. Indeed, some of those cases are P16 positive. But we went, when we went on to do um, 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 a highly um, sensitive and a specific test like an mRNA ish, they were negative actually for high risk HPV. So that is my only experience with adenoid cystic carcinomas. I don't have any experience with other type of salivary gland, gland cancers such as mucodermal carcinoma. So, so the cases that you saw, they showed transcriptionally active high risk HPV in them. Yes, sir. They were genomic, integrated genomic. So we oh, so they are integrated way, genomic cases. So this way, you avoid contamination. You avoid uh, climbing yeah. on the on the wagon, quote unquote. Because you know, so, 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 <laughs> you know, yeah, it yeah. could be very easily. That's defeated. right. Yes. So that is very interesting for me because and, yeah, that's that's a proof. That's, but yeah, I, that is very that, that is. Very, that is very interesting for me, but I'm not sure still whether they are truly causative because uh, obviously we know that mucopodermal carcinomas have got their own genetic alterations. Um, and uh, so um, so I, I'm still not so sure about, um, and I don't have any experience in testing those for, for high-risk HPV. So I cannot tell you um, exactly, but um, uh, probably and most, um, probably they are truly not associated with high-risk HPV. You, so you said that Dr. Skalova has got the same stance on this. Dr. Skalova against... is, is eminent about, against it. She does not <laughs> favor, uh, according to some most of the studies that are for her, she does not favor yeah. having HPV relationship yeah. to the, her to the tumors. Are. So yeah, well, we, we should we should make it. sense because a lot of these cancers have got their own genetic alterations. And but but you know what, with 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 a, with a high risk HPV, as as it's as it's becoming, um, we are exploring it more and more. We are finding, uh, uh, um, 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 you know, people are changing their views with time. Like I said, when, when Dr. Supin Vu came and said that, look, the oral squamous cell carcinoma in situs can be associated with high-risk HPV, a lot of the head and neck pathologists said, no, um, um, uh, they, they, we cannot have precursor lesions because where the HPV-positive oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas occur in the tonsillar crypts, there is, there is no precursor lesion there because of the morphology of the crypts. So we do not accept your view of having a high-risk HPV-positive. But now you can see there are reports coming out telling us that they have got a buoyant morphology and they can be positive for high-risk HPV. So maybe in the near future, maybe high-risk HPV does play a role in some of these cancers. So, 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 so I don't Hello. really know. Hello. <laughs> We'll find out. <laughs> Thank we'll you again. Out Hello. Yeah. My, <laughs> sorry. Hi. Yes. Thank. Yeah. Thank you for the lecture. You're yeah. Welcome. I just want to find out. Uh, in trying to screen for HPV of the oral and oropharyngeal region, uh, yes. what is the best way to take samples? Is it by to take saliva or to take uh, swabs? And for the swabs, you need to be site specific. You need to take swabs from the oral region and the pharyngeal region, or it's just okay to take uh, saliva for HPV screening in high risk individuals, especially. Thank you. Are you talking? To, uh, sorry, are you talking about the screening for the oral cavity um, 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 uh, um, and oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas? I believe. Yes, um, for both, yes. for oral cavity cancer and oropharyngeal cancer. And uh, we're trying to screen for HPV uh, types in high-risk individuals. So what is the best way to take uh, samples for such uh, research? Do I take saliva so, 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 or should I? Yeah, so, so that actually, that, that cannot be helpful just because uh, the patient has got high risk or high risk behavior by taking swabs in the mouth. Even if you show high risk HPV, uh, being 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 positive, it doesn't mean that that is going to translate into cancer. Is that do I did, did I get your question right? Because you can have oh, high yes. risk HPV as a because you can have high risk HPV as a passenger uh, in in the oral cavity and it cannot even do anything there. So um, uh, just we cannot just simply um, take a swab or um, 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 or, or any uh, or, or um, from the oral cavity and 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 test that for 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 for. For high risk HPV, even if it does show high risk HPV there, it might just be a, a passenger uh, infection in the oral cavity. Whether that is going to turn many years later into cancer, I cannot tell you about that. But like you know that uh, most of these, um, the, our immune system gets rid of um, um, a lot of these things, the same as the, the cervical cancers, not all cervical uh, um, HPV related lesions are going to evolve into cancer. So. 
So um, I don't think just by taking a swab from the oral cavity and taking for high-risk PHBB is a good idea to screen patients for these type of cancers. I think Professor Hiller does agree with me on that, if you would like to comment on. Yes, uh, I think that uh, we've uh, done smears of, 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 of persons in which we've done DNA typing of the uh, in leukemia based pathology, and we actually picked up various types of HPV uh, without any evidence of disease. So um, I don't think that uh, uh, circulating HPV um, that's recognized by PCR is going to be translating into disease necessarily. Uh, we know for the cervix, it's a little bit more um, more uh, specific and uh, at the moment uh, for cervical cancer, patients get screened for HPV infection. And that is done by, by um, the pap smear. So, but I don't think we have the same situation in the oral pharynx and the oral cavity. Um, I don't think, I think it's too much of a, a multi, uh, I think the, 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 the microbiome in the oral cavity and the oral pharynx is much more complex. So, um, I don't think that you can actually prove that somebody is going to have HPV infection just by the presence of uh, HPV DNA in, in a swab. Okay, all right. Um, can I ask a question? So taking that, okay. No, please go ahead. So, so taking that forward, so you're saying that um, uh, this uh, screening for screening of high risk uh, individuals for and for their tendency to have um, oropharyngeal cancer is something that is not encouraged. And so how do you screen such patients? Is anything like that for, because I know in the literature, maybe in the past, we've, such things have been canvassed, that you screen a patient for oral HPV. So is it something we don't do anymore? And what's the latest uh, thing now? Thank you. Professor, do you, you want like me to answer? answer, sir? Do you want yes, me to Professor, answer? Yes, Professor, go ahead. Yes, please go ahead. Um, no, I, I think that um, it is it's not of value to screen just for the presence of uh, passenger uh, DNA, passenger HPV. Um, and the problem is that you cannot detect early oropharyngeal cancer because it happens in the tonsils. Uh, or in the lymphoid tissue that in Waldai's ring. So unfortunately, that's why most of the oropharyngeal carcinomas do manifest with a metastasis. And then only one looks for the primary uh, because unless you do a routine tonsillectomy for everybody, um, you might pick up maybe some incipient HPV positive cancers, but you cannot see that and you cannot take biopsies of the tonsils uh, at random. Um, and probably in the early stages, um, the, 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 the carcinogenesis uh, in that reticular system is, is, is invisible. So it's only when, when one sees something that's abnormal that, uh, that can be pick up clinically um, that you'll have to start investigating whether this is HPV positive or uh, just an ordinary smoking and tobacco related cancer. And it's different for, for the cervix. It's a different environment. You cannot, you cannot compare. The only thing is that, yeah. that I have a question for is, okay. is it possible? We do know about a polyclonality of oral cancer that or some oral cancers are, are not monoclonal, but polyclonal. That in that recent uh, published article where there's been HPV positivity found in, in parts of the cancer that were non-keratinizing, whereas adjacent to those cancers that was keratinizing epithelium, uh, malignant epithelium that was actually negative. But my question is, is, could it be that some of those 
cancers that are HPV positive uh, report in oral cavity actually ha harbor several clones or at least two different clones, one HPV related and the other one tobacco uh, and alcohol related. Well, uh, I, um, are you asking me, Prof. <laughs> yeah, because I mean, that's one of yeah. the questions. So, so, um, yeah. Well, um, I cannot answer that question. Um, um, this is basically of the information that I currently have from, from the, the research that, uh, that, uh, that um, 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 Dr. Um, uh, James Lewis published, and he characterized the morphology of these tumors. Or if there are several clones, because like you said, it's a non-keratinizing morphology with areas of keratinocytic maturation. Is it possible we have got two clones here? So your, your point is very valid here, but I think maybe there should be another study trying to investigate this. If you want, I don't have an answer for you on this one. <laughs> but but you are uh, absolutely fine. You're right, yeah. Because even looking at morphology of these things, it could be, it's possible. I'm going to ask one last short question. Uh, what is the current state of knowledge on the reason why uh, why the HPV related carcinomas are less aggressive? So, so, so HPV positive or pharyngeal squamous carcinomas are less aggressive uh, because of their unique molecular profile. Unlike your conventional um, smoking and alcohol-related um, um, squamous cell carcinomas, they're usually associated with direct DNA damage and also mutations. Various with, um, with, uh, with HPV-positive or pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas is indirect alteration of the DNA. So, so ba it's basically um, the, um, the, the, it's the virus that inactivates uh, parts of the DNA. So that's why they have got a better, so you still have got your, your P3, P53 protein is not, comp it's still functional, your wild type. So they are, these cells are more are likely to undergo hypoptosis when you, when you radiate them. And I'd, like I said, also with the E6 and E7, they constantly put these radiation damaged cells into the, into the, into the cell cycle. So they increase the radio sensitivity of, the, of, of these cells. So it's, it's unique molecular profile that gives it its, 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 its better survival in comparison to your um, conventional um, um, smoking and alcohol related oral pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas or oral squamous cell carcinomas that usually show mutations of, of P53 and retinoblastoma protein and not only inactivation. Yeah, I, I guess it's, I, I just wanted to double check it with you basically, because uh, <laughs> yes. taking a shortcut way of finding my answer. But uh, yeah. the thing is, I feel that because uh, they also occur at an uh, earlier age, so essentially not enough uh, time has passed for the mutations to accumulate as much. Like you said, there yeah. are parts that are absolutely and, functional. So and, you, and you're actually right about that because um, uh, there has been reports that uh, 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 older patients with, with HPV positive or pharyngeal squamous cell carcinomas do, uh, do worse than uh, uh, younger patients. And even in our study, we had a case of a 70 year old lady that was high risk HPV positive or pharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma, and she, she died six months after diagnosis. So it just shows, uh, yes, maybe the age also plays a very important role. <laughs> yes. It happens earlier, intervention happens earlier, and uh, yes, maybe. That's right. It's a, it, that has always been of interest to me because I feel yes. if we are trying to prevent, uh, we know that the oral cancers are very aggressive compared to the others. So if we can find ways that we can make them less aggressive, and if one of the ways to go is somehow to use whatever HPV does, I don't know. It, it's just something sitting there at the back of my mind. Yes. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that was You're welcome. Uh, great. Um, I, it was really an honor having me here at your anniversary, Oral Pathology India. And uh, one of my greatest wishes is to come to India. And uh, it's really a beautiful, majestic uh, country to me, something um, that I would like to visit. And with a lot of history, a lot of cultures, a lot of religions. And it has always been quite fascinating to me. I've never had a chance to visit, but I will really make sure to visit one day. Definitely you should. You will be our guest. And Thank you very much. Have you here. Yes, definitely. Thank you. So, uh, Selvi, anything you have to add? Anything?
So oh, thank you, Dr. Rami. That was a wonderful You're presentation, welcome. and you uh, you have answered all the queries very patiently. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me share your certificate. I think he is so exhausted. Yes, Dr. Amir, I hope you're still there and your certificate is here. I know you're exhausted. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm going to take a nap now. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Care. Okay. Yeah. Bye, bye. 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 So, okay. Now, before we wrap up, thank you everybody for being here. And uh, this was great. I have to thank uh, Dr. Selvi for her assistance and the college's assistance. Uh, thank Dr. Nandini for being there. She is sort of keeping an eye on both sides. And Dr. Anita for stepping in and making that very interesting quiz. And for everybody who missed that link, which was shared, it was shared here also. And it is also shared on YouTube. It was also in the email that was sent to everybody today. So that was the link to which you have to send the responses for the quiz. The answers I will share on Tuesday when I'm also sharing the results. So that is on the oral pathology Tuesdays as usual. And uh, also just one more thing before we go. And please hang on. I have to share the feedback uh, form link so that you can get your certificates. But just before that, there is something else I want to try one more round. Be patient with me. This sort of really... Uh, Mandana, can I just yeah. join in? Yes, um, you can. You can, uh, please. Uh, I would like to um, uh, tell that uh, Dr. Nandini is professor and head, Department of Oral Pathology, Regional Institute of Medical Sciences, Dental College at Imphal. And that is in Manipur state. And that is in the eastern part of India. Yeah. Thank you, Nandini. Yes, thank you, Nandini. Nandini is uh, one of the many pillars of oral pathology 360 that holds everything together. And she is always there and always helping. And uh, yeah. I have to thank everyone. So anyway, there was this thing that I am trying this one more round. Please be patient with me. I, I am very keen on sharing the souvenir with you all. And I hope this time it works the way it is supposed to. Well, it is being shared. So yes, this is the souvenir and uh, it has the details of everything that happened during the conference. And yes, it also has, of course, begins with Oral Pathology 360. So. And there are some interesting numbers there, including what all we have done. And it has been thanks to everybody, all of you who have always been there with us. So, and uh, of course, this was the organizing team and the organizing institutions. And I thank every one of them from across the world. We could get together and we could put together this event, which was attended by people from over 36 countries, we had many hours of viewing and the hop-in status said that they were actually, we were beyond the industry average by 10% of everybody who watched and who attended. So that was something really great. And uh, I will share the link for this, anybody can see it. And in a few days, I will also share the uh, actual uh, PDF also, so you can download. This one, you can only see it in this format on the browser, which means on your system. And uh, yes, many people have worked towards it. It has been uh, very... And there is thanks to everybody who helped, everybody who was a part, everybody who attended. And I would be failing in my duty and in what I should really do if I don't mention that I really need to thank Dr. Daftari for his support very silently and quietly. He is always in the background. We know him as our senior most kindest, sweetest person around as far as oral pathology goes. And uh, he's always there with us. He's always there for us. And he has helped also immensely in always supporting this. There have been many people who have helped and uh, 
some say uh, that I, I'm like a, you know one woman army, but truly I'm not. And I, I'm I'm just lucky. I have a lot of support, a lot of people who help, right? From all the institutions to all the people you saw. I will not take every name. That could take a long time, but there are many many pillars. You see them every week attending, every week there, and whenever they can, and they are there regularly in the programs. And for all of that, I thank them. I thank every one of you for uh, being a part of this community and I hope we can do much, much more in the near future. So, yes, there, right. So can I request everyone to put on your cameras one more round, we will take one shot and then we will say bye. Hello, Dr. Nasser. So nice that you are here, yes. Hello, everybody. Thank you for running a great touch. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for turning on your cameras. Yes, now we shall take the shot. Okay. Yes. So with that, I shall say bye. I do hope we will see you next year in our third anniversary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everyone.